Happy Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. And let's begin with a quick U.S.-China update. Yesterday, Monday, President-elect Donald Trump made clear his intention to impose a 10% tariff on all goods from China on his first day in office. The comment, made via post on platform Truth Social, immediately followed one in which Trump said his first of, quote, many executive orders on January 20th, end quote, would impose tariffs on 25% on all products from Mexico and Canada. The threat stems from his accusations that China is responsible for, quote, shipping illegal drugs, including fentanyl, into the United States, end quote. Trump's comments specifically referred to China's failure to crack down on drug trafficking, despite previous promises of severe penalties for offenders. This tariff move, he said, would remain in place until China addresses the issue more effectively. As regular viewers know, the trade relationship between the United States and China has been a source of tension for several years, with the U.S. having already imposed tariffs on Chinese goods during Trump's first term. These tariffs were part of a broader strategy to address trade imbalances, intellectual property concerns, and what the U.S. views as unfair trade practices by China. However, Trump's new tariff threat is framed around the drug crisis, notably the fentanyl epidemic that has caused thousands of deaths in the United States. China has rejected these accusations, yet the U.S.-China trade conflict shows no sign of abating, and such tariff threats could further strain diplomatic and economic ties, potentially leading to retaliatory measures from China. A 10% tariff on China is lower than the 20-30% to 30 that markets expected, Kinga Lau, chief China equity strategist at Goldman Sachs, said in a Tuesday interview with U.S. media. While campaigning for a second term in office, Trump made even larger tariff threats, suggesting that he would impose a levy of 60% or more on Chinese goods. But this could still happen. Neil Thomas, a fellow for Chinese politics at the Asia Society Policy Institute's Center for China Analysis, observed today, quote, This tariff is specifically aimed at cracking down on the fentanyl trade and does not necessarily mean that Trump's promised 60% tariffs on all Chinese imports are off the table. China will register its opposition and consider limited retaliation, but is likely to respond cautiously at first to Trump's threats until it gets a better sense of the balance between confrontation and deal-making in his second term. End quote. Meanwhile, as Donald Trump prepares to return to the White House, global markets are bracing for potential disruptions to trade and supply chains, particularly with China. Even before the November election, many companies began ex expediting shipments in anticipation of policy changes. October 2024 saw the busiest month for container shipments in years, with U.S. imports hitting 2.5 million TEUs, an 8.1% increase from the previous year. Much of the surge is attributed to concerns over Trump's trade agenda. According to Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin, since Trump's victory on the 6th of November, container shipping inquiries from China to the United States have spiked as businesses attempt to get exports and stockpile inventory before tariffs potentially rise. During his first term, Trump's trade war with China resulted in a sharp increase in tariffs, which led to a decline in China's share of U.S. imports from 21.9% in 2017 to 14.1% in 2023. In the high-tech sector, tensions between the U.S. and China could further escalate, particularly regarding semiconductors. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co. is already halting certain AI chip shipments to China in response to U.S. export restrictions. Trump's cabinet picks, including China hawk Senator Marco Rubio, suggest a more confrontational stance, while figures like Elon Musk, nominated for a government efficiency role, may push for a more moderate approach. Overall, markets and experts will be watching the administration's handling of trade, technology and energy policies very closely. And we will be following all of this too here on China Update. It is going to be a big year for trade and security as the competition between China and the US intensifies as we move into 2025. Make sure you're subscribed to China Update if you want to follow these developments as they happen. Next up, we move to the Chinese economy and industrial policy. But just quickly, if you're enjoying today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit the like button. Liking, sharing, and subscribing are all tremendous helps for the channel. And Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are also in the description for those who want to go the extra mile and help me keep China Update financially sustainable. 
Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Now, China's industrial policy has become a focal point of global economic discussions in recent years, attracting both criticism and emulation. Beijing's use of state support to guide industries and investments has raised concerns about market distortions and structural overcapacity. Stanford University-based Big China Data published an excellent report last week on this theme called Wins and Losses, Chinese Industrial Policy's Uneven Success. The report argues that China's industrial policy is shaped by a distinctive blend of decentralized economic governance, its communist legacy, and significant openness to foreign direct investment. Launched in 2006, the Made in China 2025 policy, quote, exemplified China's long-term strategy to enhance self-reliance in advanced technologies, end quote. However, their research highlights a mixed record of success. For example, while innovation subsidies under the Made in China 2025 framework increased R&D spending, they did not consistently boost productivity or profitability. According to the Stanford report, there are several lessons to be drawn from the research on industrial policy. The first is the importance of policy flexibility to adjust to the needs of firms, implementation agencies, and international developments. The second is that policies should be designed to reduce distortion and introduce as much discipline as possible for companies through competition and market incentives. Thirdly, policymakers should recognize the importance of global value chains to innovation and acknowledge the costs associated with a more isolationist stance. The report concludes that the expansion of industrial policy in China, quote, raises broader questions on the future of the global rules-based order. Current institutional arrangements are unequipped to deal with a world where multiple large economies are openly pursuing industrial policy. End quote. And indeed, big players like the United States, the EU and others have responded to China's industrial policy with protectionist policies, most notably, of course, increases in tariff rates. Now, one of the great symbols of China's massive industrial policy, with all its pros and cons, is the country's massive network of high-speed rail. This week, US-based The Wall Street Journal published a long-form article discussing this system as it relates to China's wider fiscal agenda and industrial policy. China's high-speed network is set to exceed 30,000 miles, already enough to circle the globe, with further expansions aiming to add nearly 15,000 miles by 2035. China's high-speed rail encapsulates Xi Jinping's focus on advanced technology and state-driven development. This colossal project prioritizes collective benefits and national prestige. High-speed rail has transformed... High-speed rail has transformed travel for millions, reducing travel times and promoting urbanization. Core routes like Beijing to Shanghai have thrived, with millions of passengers relying on these lines for business and leisure. Yet the expansion goes far beyond connecting major cities. High-speed rail has reached rural and less populous regions, such as Foshun County in Sichuan Province. Here, despite a shrinking population and limited demand, multiple new stations have been constructed. At Fushun Station, a massive facility designed to accommodate thousands sees only a trickle of travelers, raising questions about the sustainability of such investments. The rapid expansion of high-speed rail has come at an extraordinary financial cost. Over half a trillion US dollars has been spent on tracks, trains, and stations in the past five years alone. And the China State Railway Group now shoulders nearly one trillion US dollars in debt and liabilities. The system's maintenance costs and annual debt servicing requirements of 25 billion US dollars further exacerbates the financial burden. On top of this, there are only a few core lines, like Beijing to Shanghai and Shanghai to Guangzhou, which are financially sustainable. Almost all other routes are losing money. While ridership has rebounded post-COVID-19, some lines, particularly in rural areas, struggle to justify their construction costs, unable to even meet the cost of electricity, let alone capital costs and other costs. For example, passenger numbers on the Fushun line average just 9,000 trips daily, a fraction of the ridership on profitable routes like Shanghai to Hangzhou, for example. Critics such as Beijing Jiao Tong University scholar Zhao Jian argue that China would have been better served by focusing on high-density corridors and investing in traditional railways that could also handle freight. Now, despite these 
serious financial challenges, proponents highlight the positive knock-on effects of high-speed rail, such as reducing pollution, shortening business travel times, and boosting regional economies, though research has showed mixed results when it comes to boosting regional economies. Indeed, it seems that these routes mean that people leave these areas to move to more important urban clusters. The network has also become a point of national pride, fostering goodwill through low ticket prices that make high-speed travel accessible to many. On this point, however, there are two problems. Even at subsidized rates, there are hundreds of millions of Chinese in the poorest regions who are unable to afford the tickets. And two, this further level of subsidization means that the true cost of this network is probably much larger than the already concerning balance sheet situation would suggest. State media focuses on new trains as feats of Chinese engineering that create well-paying jobs. As the Wall Street Journal writes, quote, At work sites as high as 14,000 feet above sea level, one of China's priciest rail projects is taking shape, linking Tibet's capital of Lasha with the central city of Chengdu in Sichuan at a cost of more than 50 billion US dollars. End quote. However, economists warn that resources poured into rail projects may come at the expense of addressing other critical needs. China faces pressing challenges, including an aging population, insufficient social safety nets, and education gaps. Investments in infrastructure while offering immediate economic boosts may divert funds from initiatives that could yield long-term benefits for citizens. And of course, as regular viewers know, the fiscal situation at the local level is at a crisis point. If local governments are forced to radically cut back on their fiscal agenda, things like high-speed rail may represent a tempting infrastructure project to cut back on. But of course, operating them also is a weight on local government balance sheets. As China continues to expand its high-speed rail network, its leaders face tough choices, striking a balance between showcasing technological prowess and ensuring financial sustainability will be crucial. While the trains have undeniably transformed transportation, the long-term viability of duplicating routes and building in sparsely populated areas remains uncertain. We end today with this final observation from Peking University Professor of Finance Michael Pettis. Quote, on China's expanding high-speed rail network, about 10 years ago there was a fierce debate about whether or not expanding the system made economic sense. But by now, I think that most analysts recognize that the purpose of continuing to expand the rail system was not to generate long-term economic benefits, but rather to create short-term GDP growth. Now, you even hear government officials indirectly acknowledge the point. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Tuesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.